Hey everybody, welcome back to Backtracking, the podcast where we look back at the real-world inspirations behind classic episodes of Star Trek. I'm one of your hosts, Caliban, and you know I'm from the Federation, a cool cat like a Cation, and I'm not throwing away my shot. I'm joined on this episode by my co-host. I'm Gooey Fame, and I'm, I'm still getting the doors on this spaceship here. <laughs> we, we have returned to explore the stories behind your favorite Trek shows. And today we are talking about two stories about children and how they process the media that they consume. It's the 1985 Joe Dante film Explorers and the Star Trek, the original series first season episode, The Squire of Gothos. And <laughs> buckle up. It's all going to make sense in just a little bit. Yeah. I was, when we started this, I was like, what's going on here? What are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. like I like where it ended up. Yeah. We're going to it might be more mortar than uh, than bricks here, but we'll we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> uh, at this point of the show, we often talk about the news in the world of Trek. But, you know, there isn't a lot of news in the world of Trek right now. And that's fine. Trek is uh, humming along, just purring along. But I did want to mention that it's our 75th uh, show, uh, show number 75. And I felt like we should do something, but I didn't know oh. what we should do. I think you and I are cut somewhat from the same cloth in that we're both um, have a workmanlike approach to this. Like we just we just do it. We try to do it the best we can, and nobody's All there. To st- <laughs> we need a producer to stop and go, "Hey guys, maybe you should say something about the fact that you've done it twenty five shows, fifty shows, seventy five shows." That's how uh, all my podcasts are. Where I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> like I'll see someone do like this is our fiftieth episode, and I was like, Yay. wait, when was that? And I look and I oh that already happened <laughs> yeah i didn't do anything yeah, yeah. we just we just forgot that one so i apologize to all the uh, anniversaries and birthdays uh, in my life but uh, it's kind of one for us and i think that you know maybe i don't know um next year uh, year number number four we'll uh have to do something special let's do episode 100 we're not episode far from that 100 yeah i'm trying to think of what we would have to do we'll find like the best the the best fit or the worst fit or the thing that fits to to several things maybe we um, could do do like another one where like cuz we like to stretch it but maybe we could just do like we'll do whatever we want no oh, we just pick like whatever and then uh, maybe try to look for uh, what we can find in it yeah go yeah. fishing a fishing yeah, trip yeah sure <laughs> cuz we've already got some big swings um this this season uh, you know this year we're doing uh, a couple different books uh we're doing the uh the catalog of a musician again and so mm. You know, I mean, like we stretch ourselves every day, you know, I, I, it's not like I phone it in and then I bring it back every 25 episodes. That's true. Yeah, we do. Yeah, maybe we need to do. I don't know. We we got to do one extreme, either like the best thing or the worst thing. Yeah, <laughs> I was looking. Uh, I, I was on a Facebook group on, uh, on on Facebook, a Star Trek group. And some no, actually, that's not true. I, I was on an Expanse group uh, and they were talking about. Uh, just randomly, somebody brought up the movie Aniara, which we covered covered a couple uh, episodes ago, and it, uh, just the fact that like it's sort of a hard sci-fi kind of uh, space is kind of a bleak place, you know. Watch out! And they were praising the movie, and everybody else was like, "Oh, I tried to watch it; it was so boring." Uh, blah blah blah. But I did get to organically kind of plug the show by just saying, "You're in the Expanse forum." good chance that you're a star trek fan Ooh. and therefore <laughs> and of a certain age you probably like voyager so maybe check out our episode that com- compares aniara and the episode night well if you're if you made it to here from there thank you for listening. yeah if you if you're listening <laughs> right now uh thanks so much and uh yeah the, uh, the expanse isn't uh it's bleak but it's it's bleak in a very realistic way you know trek mm. trek is supposed to be positive that's built into it and it not only does it make it tough sometimes to really um, to really nail down the kind of criticisms that you're making of society when it's an alien or something. I mean, you know, the, the most explicit metaphor track has is the white face on one side, black face on the other. But it's just so weird that it doesn't it kind of veers off from like the real life racism that we see. And so that's the problem that it's got. Aniara is more of an existential thing. I don't think I'll ever be on a ship that's, you know, heading for Mars and then ends up going somewhere else and then I die on that ship. But the Expanse is dark simply because it's our real world. They've just got really fast ships, you know, (laughs) like it's still Mm. it's capitalism. It is uh, people suffering. uh, You know, there is a many, many have or have nots and uh, only a few haves. And it's just like our world projected 
a couple hundred years into the future of our solar system. And so it's it's great. Like it's a fun, you know, zippy uh, military action show. But yeah, every lesson they give you is like, geez, that's happening in like in my life right now. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's always selling the show to me and it always sounds so good. I just. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, that it's on my list of like cool trying sci-fi to... shows, I guess. Yeah. Well, um, I'll um, I'm trying to think there's probably a, a, a sci-fi uh, or a Star Trek writer or two that might have made their way over there. So I'll look over the list of episodes <laughs> and see if there's anything that uh, would plug into a, a Trek situation. But yeah, um, I'm trying to it's all on Amazon, so it's easy to watch um, as far as that goes. I'm trying to think um, of where you can watch Battlestar Galactica. I don't even know because I haven't watched it uh, recently, right? but yeah. that's another good one to watch. It's um, you know, I'm having a hard enough time keeping up with all the Star Trek. So yeah, much. No, no kidding, no kidding. Uh, you're caught up on uh, Strange New Worlds, right? I, I, you know what? I'm caught up on two things because I finally watched the season finale of Discovery. That okay, I was putting off just yeah. the one episode. And I was like, okay. Um, and then, yeah, I've watched the first two episodes of Strange New Worlds. And I was like, hey, yeah, I kind of like this. It's definitely, you know, it's it's going for the, hey, you like Star Trek, right? This is the, this is the Star Trek of the Star Trek shows. But it's, yeah. it's working on me. I'm liking it. You have to kind of hand it to Picard, uh, if you've been watching that. Where when they bring that train, they bring that train into the station at full speed. Like it doesn't slow down at all. It just impacts into the station and destroys it. Uh, and it is very entertaining. Whereas like Discover, the, the the most recent finale of Discovery was like fine. But a lot of t- the last couple seasons of Discovery, I feel like they have their big idea. And then they kind of write backwards from that. And so you never, I never really feel like I'm being pulled around by the plot in any way that you can't really just predict. So you yeah. know that they're going to be a weird alien, and they were, and then they're going to have a little bit of trouble communicating with them, but they, they fix it eventually. There, Nobody really that we care about dies. And, and and so it's just like, yeah, we did it, but, you know, who, who really cares? And then the end of Picard, which, uh, you know, I heard that there was like, you know, a lot of problems like writing the show and, and doing, uh, getting what they wanted to do done, but... It's just it's so it's so crazy that if you just let go like a roller coaster and stick your arms in the air, it is kind of enjoyable. For Picard, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll have to. That's that's next because I I only watched the first two for that um, discoverage we did, and now I have yeah. her, I have her all ready to go. So I'm gonna make my way through that, and that's yeah, what well, I'm that's what luck. I'm hoping to do. I that's I I try to go into these with the like. I'm just going to kind of like go with the flow and enjoy it. But it just some shows, I think, just don't gel with me. I, I was noticing that but like watching Strange New Worlds, it's it's not even just like there's a lot of things that I, I was noticing that it's like, oh, yeah, that's what I like better because it's not just like, oh, it's episodic and stuff like that. But I was noticing there were scenes where they're just chilling talking about yeah. what they're going to do. The camera's yeah. not whipping around. They're just like, yeah, we uh, we invited Sam Kirk down here. Like he's presenting like, you know, it's yeah. a meeting yeah. and I love that. And then I was like trying to watch the finale discovery and it's like the same kind of scenes, but <laughs> I'm like, Calm yeah, down. I don't know. Yeah. I was a little wary about like the captain having like half the crew come to his, uh, to his cabin for, uh, for a, a luau or something like that. But, but I love the way that they clearly, planned that as part of that hour of TV, that story, like it sort of set up, you know, the conflicts that were coming. Whereas Mm -hmm. I feel like, especially in season like four of Discovery, there's just a template. And so they go, the episode starts, uh, there's a problem, Michael Burnham, you have to fix the problem, but don't fix it in your Michael Burnham way, fix it in the right way. And then there's fill in the blank, there's a scene where Michael meets with someone, Tilly or somebody goes, boy, I don't know if we can do it. Then there's, an, you know, another scene, another scene, mm-hmm. another scene. So they've had scenes like the dinner scene on Discovery, but they don't, they, they feel more rote than this kind of organic scene where these characters are getting to know each other. And then you find out about Uhura that like, oh, maybe she didn't really want to be in Starfleet. And then some people are kind of like Spock has to pull her aside and go, 
you can't say stuff like that because there are people here like look at Ortega's like this is her whole life and you're mm -hmm. just like yeah I don't know if I want to do this and so like setting up these like subtle um, layers of the interactions in the characters I thought was really really great I also thought that that second episode is very similar to an episode of Voyager that maybe we'll be able to talk about on this show someday. Hey. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, we got to get you back on uh, Discoverage in the future to talk about Strange New Worlds. Yeah, I, I will, I'll probably be a totally different guest if it stays... Like, it's, I'm, I'm not watching them like, this is the greatest thing ever, but if it stays, like, enjoy... They've both been, like... They end, and I'm like, that was pretty good. <laughs> Just, like, <laughs> such a different feeling. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll imagine if it stays, like, that good, I will be a much different guest I'll... I won't have to hold back my griping as much. <laughs> oh, we would never, we would never ask you to hold back. <laughs> uh, yeah, the more the more drama, the better. For oh yeah, you know it's okay sometimes to start a little internet drama. It's interesting to have <laughs> that feeling too of being able to say that was a pretty good one because when they are more serialized, you 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 never. It's like a, it's like a lot of edging or something. It's like you don't get to go okay. That's all right. That was an episode. Here's how I feel about it. Like you always have to kind of come back for the next week. And, you know, there are things that happen only in a certain episode of Discovery. You know, there are little uh, arcs and little things that happen. But yeah, just being able to like watch them start something, figure out the problem, end it. Mm -hmm. And then you go, OK, mm -hmm, that was like a nice little meal. Like, uh, let me digest that now. Yeah. And that's just I get that like. Some people like one way, some people like the other way. That's just how I was brought up watching TV, and I just feel more at home when I when I see stuff like that. I do like, yeah, I do like, you know, the other way, too. Like, I don't know, I was really into, like, you know, a Breaking Bad when it was out, and I was like, ooh, what's going to happen next week? Um, <laughs> yeah. That's, like, I like those kind of kind of deals. I don't know why that's not even a current reference, Well, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah, I do like, there's just something, like, even if a really bad episode was the next episode, it'd be like, okay, well, that's just that episode. You know, what's next? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's fine. Whereas, like, I get really, like, if something, like, really takes me off course on, like, a show like Discovery, it then affects, it's like dominoes. You know what I mean? Then, like, the next week, I'm like, well, I already didn't like or care about this. <laughs> and now it's just continuing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Whereas, like, Stranger Worlds, I feel like they got the ratio better, where it's just like, Five minutes an episode so far, you know, he's talking about his deal with like seeing his death. And it's yeah. like if if I didn't like that, which I like it so far, it'd be like, OK, that's easy to get past. You know what I mean? It's not really yeah. like maybe it'll maybe the, you know, finale or whatever that deals with it'll be good. Maybe not. But the episode itself, it's separate from that. Pretty good. Yeah. We'll have to see where they go with that. And insofar as they are doing a season long arc it, or maybe a series long arc, it's definitely that because they're they've hit that twice now. Um, what I think is interesting is obviously that kind of comes from the original concept of the character. But this is like over 50 years later and we have seen so much stuff happen in Star Trek and so much technology. Like I find it hard to believe that a character would be confined to a beeping wheelchair, you know, in the hologram infused uh, wave a wand and it does anything kind of future that we now know the 23rd century to be. Um, right. I yeah. think that idea of a, especially for the, um, the people who fought in World War II who wrote these episodes, seeing somebody, you know, come back uh, just devastatingly wounded, you know, or or crippled in some way um, made a lot more sense. Now, of course, I mean, that still happens today. But like in this world where we can just give uh, salamanders, turn them back into human beings, you know, or split two Vicks back into two guys. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they'll find out. I, I keep thinking that they keep talking about it because they're going to try to find a way to get him out of it somehow. You know, like that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. But, you know, I mean, it's all it, it, these these characters, the whole story constantly evolves. I like Pike enough to just, yeah, do whatever you guys want. That's that's what I say. I do like Pike. Yeah. Um, so props props to them. I think the character is interesting enough that I want to see what happens with him, you know? Yeah, me too. 
And we will in the future. Uh, but for now, let's get to our featured subject for this week's episode. It is a proven scientific fact, don't look it up, that violent media and video games don't turn kids into murderers. But nobody could plausibly defend the idea that we take nothing at all from the media that we consume. After all, how many fans love Star Trek specifically because of the aspirational world that it presents its audience? Each of us is a melange of the media we both choose to consume and the culture that we simply marinated in as we developed, even if we don't necessarily understand what we're watching or what we're experiencing through the eyes of our childhood. It's a theme that Hollywood genre master Joe Dante would explore in his 1985 film, Explorers. computer on the modem and filled in some details in your drawing. So I used my computer, which is only a 128K, but that should be enough to find out what it does, if it does anything at all. If we had something to sit in, all three of us could fly around in this thing. Ah. Launch. And if that seems like a high-minded description of a film that wasn't as good as, as Gremlins, uh, starring a bunch of kids <laughs> flying a thing around, then you didn't watch the movie close enough. Also, uh, this movie was eviscerated by Paramount Pictures in order to get it really? out during summer 1985. Oh. There were a lot of ideas that Dante... And the screenwriter wanted in this film that they uh, just kind of had to drop. But that there are all these scenes in this film of kids interacting with their parents. You know, we see the parents, um, you know, interacting with them, thinking about them, trying trying to connect with them or not. There's the whole runner with like the Darren character and like his complicated relationship with his father. And it's like you get the idea that like as these kids are having this adventure, sure, it's cool. Sure, it's just like one of um, Ben's, uh, you know, uh, amazing fantasy magazines. But they are kind of becoming more – they're losing their innocence a little bit. And they're, when they come back, they kind of understand um, their, their situation a little more. And also, um, yeah, yeah, for sure. They start they start flying around in dreams. But, yeah, they do that too. <laughs> they do, yeah. It feels like I, – I see what you mean, like – there was a lot of parts in the movie where I felt like, oh, is this trying to get at like X thing in my head that I think it is? And then it, it kind of is cut short a little bit. And it's it yeah. does seem like weird. Like it, it didn't. I already kind of had the feeling before I knew anything about 
behind the scenes that like this isn't fully uh isn't fully there you know it's not fully what they were trying to get get at i guess yeah i mean i want to jump right into it but like the darren character that that is like a very potentially dark kind of storyline that's going on um there is a uh there's a deleted scene where he has a shiner because his uh, dad got a little too angry at him. Uh, and I'm glad that that's not in there because it it keeps it from getting a little too dark. But the whole movie, he he's the one parent that we don't really see. And we just hear that he's kind of possibly a kind of scary dad. But everything that Darren does is is an attempt to kind of connect with his dad. Like he wants to name the ship Thunder Road. Thunder Road good song a uh, lot of chimes in that song for a kid that likes 80s metal the mm. song is really his dad's favorite song right do you know what i mean sure, like it's yeah. a little too early for him yeah and then later on like he he brings them a beer and he's like it must be good my dad drinks a lot of it it's like oh uh, that's okay. so dark it's so dark and yeah, as they yeah. uh as they and he talks about how he's like oh my dad he's yelling at me and as they come back from the spaceship you know he sees his house and he's like i wonder what my dad's doing you know it's that idea that we things happen to us when we're kids and we don't we don't get what they how they affect us and we don't understand what's happening but it becomes clearer as we as become become older yeah and you're right you do see not much of his dad but i also feel like i only saw it really more in the uh, deleted scenes you sent me but um ethan hawk's family like you don't even really see too much yeah i feel like compared to like there was a bunch of deleted scenes and stuff with them yeah yeah, his his mom seems kind of worried about him, or maybe she just has that resting worry face, and he doesn't seem to be. Uh, he's you know he's a dreamer, uh, literally. His head is in the clouds, but yeah, that whole like subplot that gets cut about his dad, you know, kind of neglecting him, and then him wanting to go to space camp. Which I'll say, though, the more that you the lot, so there's a video on YouTube that's like a half an hour, maybe thirty five minutes of deleted scenes from this film. The first half is kind of like, okay, I can see where these were going to go. The second half, like, it gets more bug fuck, like, as it goes. Like, right, it yeah. becomes, it, it isn't just, like, little side stories that were cut. There was a whole side thing where, you know, they would, he would have the ability to, like, affect dreams in real life, and then they're like, uh, the bully comes back, and they strip the bully naked at school, and then <laughs> and then Dick Miller's involved, too. He also is like, hey, what's going on, kid? I'm in your dreams. It's like, what's, what's cool. going on? <laughs> <laughs> they lose all connection with reality by the end of the movie. Yeah, there's there was a little there's kind of a lot going on, yeah. Even even in the cut version. Uh let's let's just start off uh we've already started backwards, but like uh had you seen this film at all before we uh, sat down to watch it for this? I had honestly barely heard of it. Um mm-hmm. so no, but I was very excited to check it out cuz yeah, I didn't know it was a Joe Dante uh movie. So that that got me excited when I found that out. Yeah, it's definitely a lesser known Dante. And of course, Dante, you know, we're talking about, um, well, we will be talking about uh, people who are influenced by media and it becomes kind of shapes who they are. And he is definitely a guy who grew up just like Ben, reading these sci-fi things, watching TV, watching old movies, and uh, basing all his entire career on uh, those things that he watched. Uh, the 80s, of course, were huge for him. You know, he started with The Howling in 81. He directed one of the um, the uh, vignettes in the Twilight Zone movie, Gremlins in 84. Uh, this is, of course, 85. Inner Space after this. Ever seen Inner Space? Uh, yeah, not in a long time, but that's where they're yeah. like flying around in the guy. Yeah, <laughs> Un- underrated. I mean, at the time, yeah, it, yeah. It, did, it did really well, and then people have kind of forgotten about it. Uh, he did The Burbs in 89, uh, Gremlins 2 in 1990, and of course Matinee, which is also really uh, underrated. So he is just like knocking them out right now. And this one kind of falls through the cracks. And I remember watching, the only reason I even knew about this movie is it was on uh, TV when movies were still on TV um, (laughs) in the 80s. And I like, you know, taped it on a VHS and watched it uh, over and over. And at the time, I didn't know what an Ethan Hawke was. I didn't know what a River Phoenix was. Um, we would all come to know who they were uh, later on. Uh, this is their their first movie, uh, both of them. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's fascinating. Of course, we never got to know River Phoenix um, as well as we wanted to, but it's fascinating to me that <laughs> this has been a big month for me and Ethan Hawke because, uh, of course, we're watching this. 
I just got done seeing him in um, a bunch of Moon Knight. Mm, right. And right. he's in the Northman too. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I've been watching Ethan Hawke, like, my whole life. I feel like I know his mannerisms really well. And it's hilarious to me that even as a 12, 13-year-old kid, that's just Ethan Hawke. Like, he talks exactly the same way. He's got the kind of slightly weird teeth. And so his voice is a little higher, but when he's like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, all right. It's like, (laughs) it's just Ethan (laughs) Hawke. Yeah. When I first saw him in the movie, I was like, I don't know. Is is that him? And then once he started talking, I was like, oh, that's him. That's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. And yeah, I, I liked the list you just gave. That's like one of my, he's like, I think one of my favorite actors of all time because he's like, he's both in like one of my favorite movies, uh, First Reformed. And then he's also in another movie I really like, but like, it's like total flip side, which is he huh. like the purge, you know what I mean? And like, yeah, I feel like he does that like. I don't know. A lot of there's a lot of people with that kind of thing, like Nicolas Cage or whatever. But yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I think he's maybe that's why I just like those kind of actors who are like, you know, they're not like Leo or whatever, who's just like <laughs> it's all prestige yeah. at this point. You yeah. know? Yeah. I um I don't know where he which of his projects gave him the money to be able to just kind of do whatever he wants, because. Yeah, something like First Reformed is clearly or Good Kill. Like he's done a couple of these. Mm. Um, kind of pointed um, uh, commentary films uh, that aren't going to make a lot of money necessarily. I have not seen First Reformed. I do really want to see that. I love it. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, you know, and it's only ten years from now that he'll be uh, doing uh, Before Sunrise, you know, and Reality Bites, and so yeah, it's, uh, he started really fast. You know, if you know the story behind this, like this is one of his first. This is his first film, and it was one of the first big auditions he ever did. And, like, his parents kind of, like, let him audition but didn't think that he was going to get it. And he got it, and they didn't want him to do it. His mom didn't want him to take the role because they would have had to move to California, uh, and it would have disrupted their lives. And his dad eventually convinced her to do it but said, like, no more after this. And so he was not in anything else as a kid. Um, But then, of course, he turned 18 and immediately went back right back into films. Oh, so he really wanted to do this. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And of course, was in all the, you know, films that you think of him being in. So, um, yeah. And then, of course, you know, the story of River Phoenix. I mean, there's not a lot to say, unfortunately. Um, You know, he died very young uh, in 1993. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's good in this. And it's funny because he would become, you know, kind of like a cool guy, uh, like the sort of hot thing at the time and he was a little upset that he had to play like the nerd <laughs> type character because uh, he was like no no I'm a cool guy uh, wow <laughs> protective but, but, of his image even then yeah even then yeah and he does a good job then of course uh, the year after this he'd be in Stand By Me which is of course his breakout role yeah I feel like though of the characters of the kids in this movie when I just think of like what what's going to be like the crowd pleasing character like he got kind of the most fun of the three kids, you know? Yeah. Cause he gets to be like wacky and goofy and, you know, whereas like Ethan Hawke's kind of more like your standard guy. And then there's like yeah. the dark kid who's like got yeah. the edgy family. So you get to be like the fun one that I think like kids and families will probably like a lot more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's got, I mean, he's doing, you know, a character more than, uh, well, I don't know what uh, Jason Pressman's life is like because he was only in a couple things. But mm-hmm. yeah, he's 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 the one who's kind of actually acting. Um, and uh, of course, things didn't turn out well for him. Ethan Hawke, I guess, you know, uh, you know, I think his life turned out pretty much OK. Um, I was thinking about Stand By Me the other day. And of course, now Jerry O'Connell is in the Star Trek family. So all we need to do is uh, get Corey Feldman in and then you've got all four kids from Stand By Me. Uh, as Star Trek oh, people. They should do an episode of Strange New Worlds where they meet him and his, like, angels. Yes. Or his, like, band. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, they were both... Or do something uh, tie-in with Gremlins, because, of course, he was in uh, Gremlins with mm. Joe Dante again. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Star Trek actors, this movie has a couple. Uh, you know, we, we talk about how maybe Tom Cruise or Humphrey Bogart is the kind of patron saint of this show, but there are some people that we just can't seem to get away from no matter what. And one of those people is Dick Miller, who of course was in almost all of Joe Dante's films. And he plays Charlie Drake, the, I don't even know what he is, a sheriff's deputy or something like that. Flies a helicopter. I don't know. Yeah. Flies the helicopter in the movie. And uh, James Cromwell appears in this as well. Very early role for him. 
I think he had been on TV before that. Of course, this is way before his breakout role in Babe, but a surprisingly mm-hmm. kind of small role for him. And then, of course, Robert Picardo uh, plays triple duty here as Starkiller, Wack, and Wack and Meek's father. And Picardo, another guy that is in John, uh, Joe Dante's movies and a guy who agrees to sit still for all that makeup. He got his own little credit in the movie, too. Yeah? Mm-hmm. That was cool. I I don't know. I just did not expect that. And it's cool, like... I don't know. I always like when like an actor like that gets like a little special something extra because they deserve it. Yeah. And it's I mean, it's definitely like it's Yeoman's work. Like he he's playing three different roles. You know, he's he has to do this whole all these different voices and impressions. You could definitely see this was never like going to be a huge uh, movie. Um, the budget was relatively high for the time. It was like twenty million or, or so. But like, this seems like a get me a Robin Williams type, you know. Um, uh, okay. B- but instead, they're asking you know uh, Picardo to to do all these different voices and to do the the Catskills comedian stuff and the TV stuff, and uh, he does a great job. He was great. I couldn't even tell like some of those things that were delivered by him, like did not sound like any <laughs> yeah. like version of him I've ever heard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He's very talented. Yeah. He's uh, he's great in inner space uh, as well, uh, where he also has to do a bunch of crazy stuff, right. do crazy makeup and stuff. Oh yeah. I can picture him in all like memories and gremlins too. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, uh, a pretty good cast for uh, kind of a smaller film. Um, the film is like, it's interesting because it, Supposedly, uh, kind of came about because uh, Eric Luke wrote wrote the movie, wrote the screenplay, and it kind of came about because it was this idea of these kids who find this thing. Um, you know, they they receive these dreams or these transmissions, and they make this thing. And I think in the script there was like a scene where the kids fly in front of the moon or something like that. Like the screenwriter, I think, was obviously trying to draw on the idea of ET a couple years before, and. Steven Spielberg himself had kind of shown interest in producing it. And so that kind of got it off the ground and turned it into a project. And they initially Mm. um, had Wolfgang Peterson uh, on board to direct it. Uh, Wolfgang Peterson, of course, directed Enemy Mine, which we talked about previously on the show. Mm -hmm. And just like with Enemy Mine, he wanted to film the whole thing in Germany. Like, that's just what he... (laughs) Apparently has enough pull that he can go, no, I'm German, I want to shoot it in Germany. And then people... Uh, move it move to Germany and so <laughs> so like you know Paramount didn't want to do that and so they got somebody else and then Peterson went off and made Enemy Mine instead oh well that's cool we got two movies out of it though. we got two movies out of it yeah I'm happy <laughs> yeah two good ones yeah and, and so it has this like weird premise which kind of it's funny because have you seen have you seen the movie Contact yeah yeah oh yeah um So Contact, of course, is based on a book by Carl Sagan. That book came out in 1985. And let me just give you the premise. The book is about aliens who have watched our TV signals send us a signal that allows us to build a machine that brings us to them so they can talk to us. Oh, okay. that's And that's the movie Explorers. (laughs) So I'm not accusing anybody of, of copying anybody. I think it's very interesting that two... Thing we you know, we could have done contact and and explorers if we if were doing a non Star Trek uh, comparison podcast. Um, it's it's fascinating to me that those two things got made in the same year, especially when, and a lot of this kind of got cut out, but it's still sort of in the film. One of the focuses of the script was the idea that we are all connected to an idea of a of a collective unconscious. Um, mm. There were there was a lot more in the original script about them sharing each other's dreams and sort of like communicating telepathically with not only the aliens, but other people in the town and kind of sharing this, um, this overmind, you know, that's like a a sort of mystical idea that they wanted to put in here with, with the sci-fi elements, because we never really get an explanation as to like how the dreams work. We don't really need one, but you don't necessarily need one. No. Yeah. Yeah. But I was like thinking, I was trying to like think I was trying to think about like sci-fi stories that have a premise like this. And I thought of, of contact. Like it was like, yeah, contact that or the Star Trek, the next generation episode where, uh, Troy is, keeps having this dream about one moon and how 
they they find out that like these aliens are caught like they are in like this anomaly and they need to like you know put a certain oh. gas or chemical into the anomaly to get out but otherwise like the dream transmission of of images is um kind of like a new idea um do you ever see dreamscape the movie dreamscape no i've never seen that it. came out in 84 and that's um you know dennis dennis quaid like uh going oh. into people's dreams i I, I don't know about that like type of story, but I, I guess it's a little different. But I, I know there's like been done a lot where like aliens get our kind of like uh, they kind of pick up on our culture through like our transmissions, you know yeah. what I mean? And not necessarily yeah. talking to us. Yeah. Um, so I can think of that. But like this one takes everything like a step further. I feel like it's very weird for like what seems like is going for a family children's movie you know do you think that um it is a product of the 80s that is a decade where you know we'd really solved all of our problems of course and so we start sort of looking inward and we start to think about the effect of our own culture on you know uh, ourselves on society on children that you would get somebody coming up with the plot, oh, what if aliens saw our media and didn't get it? Like, I find it hard to think of, like, I don't, th- I can't think of any stories from, like, the 50s where somebody thought, oh, they saw this, you know, this movie about how we hate communists, and so they didn't want to come to our yeah. planet. I feel like that's a very, like, 80s idea. I think, too, it probably comes from, like, uh, you know, like, mass consumption and mass media, you know, like... Mm-hmm. I think some stories too try to have that be a little bit of a, and maybe even in this movie, like sort of a commentary, you know, cause yeah. like they're like in the scenes where, um, Neek is like doing all the stuff that's like, you know, all the stand up and all that stuff. It, it kind of is like, uh, like look how in, look how intense and insane, like our culture is, you know, how fast and, and insane <laughs> it is, you know, like, cause yeah. you're having it, like they, the kids even say like, this is total nonsense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I think that maybe goes into like, even like the nineties and stuff of like, you know, they just see the intensity of, of our media and culture, you know? Yeah. I think that as soon as, you know, TV was in every home, people immediately started to kind of think about that. And I don't know how much credence I was not I wasn't a communications major but like I don't know how much credence people gave it but you know Marshall McLuhan was saying like in the 60s the medium is the message like he was already sort of diving into the idea of mass media and how it is changing us and and what that means for our society so uh you know by the time you get to the 80s you can plug aliens into that and you got a you got a story yeah and I, I saw they were gonna they're gonna do a remake or something, so they do oh it now. God. But it'll be like our TikToks or whatever, you know. So, <laughs> part of me thinks that that might be able to work. Part of me is terrified that it will be a you know ten episode Netflix series, and it does not need to be ten hours. <laughs> and part of me thinks it'll never happen because Kerry Fukunaga was connected to it, and he is you know currently being accused of uh, sexually harassing and grooming uh, yeah. actresses. So maybe we get somebody else on that. We can get something out of it. Maybe they'll wrestle him free, for, wrestle it free from him or something. Yeah, have have Ethan Hawke be Neek, and then it's just a guy in a in a Rob Bottin level uh, uh, prosthetics, but he's just like, yeah, okay, yeah, all right, yeah. It's it's like that's just clearly that's alien Ethan Hawke. That yeah, bring him back. That'd be so good. <laughs> that's so good. Uh, it's a cool idea, and I have to say that it. I think like a lot of things in the eighties, it's. It's presented as being like, wow, bang, amazing, and yet it is uh, a little bit cynical. But despite it being kind of cynically, clearly uh, meant to appeal to kids, I remember watching this as a kid that was about the age of those kids and thinking like, that would be pretty cool. Well, how how would I deal with the problem of the oxygen? You know, where would I take the the, the Thunder Road if I if I could take it anywhere I wanted to? And I like that the film treats the it doesn't get all magic and weird uh, except for like the dream crystal and however that works. But like the physics of the thunder road are kind of um, established. I I don't want to go so far as to say hard sci-fi, but I like the fact that they are using, you know, Wolfgang's scientific method to figure everything out. I don't know if a Mac of that 
era could run something like that right. with 128k. But uh, but I like the fact that he's like, no, it works like this, and then I can reposition it. Um, you know, they we make it bigger. I like when they're tunneling under the ground like it's just like completely invulnerable it can go anywhere and do anything so he's like under the ground but he's flying through the air and they and they finally realize like we could put something in this and we could go wherever we want like that's that's a neat idea yeah that's that's why why i mean like it feels like it has so many extra steps like it doesn't have just like i feel like a normal maybe movie from this era is you get kind of like one premise and that's Mm -hmm. what it is for the whole movie but this was like they're having yeah. these dreams and they're building this thing and yeah it, and then eventually like they I'm like oh so they maybe they're not really going to go to space until like the end but then they do that and then there's like a whole like maze they're going <laughs> like like it yeah it just keeps becoming about something else which I thought was pretty wild but yeah the, it it did have like also the element of like okay we're taking it on a, like oh they did a test flight you know that's mm-hmm. kind of yeah. funny i just thought like you know, in the movie where you get the bubble that takes you to space, it's like that's the first thing that happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they and at one point they are being pulled into space and they're not ready. And so Wolfgang devises a way to sort of trick the computer and like get them back home, um, which I thought showed a lot of ingenuity and was cool. Um, let's talk about the structure of the film. Uh, <laughs> the structure of the film is odd and I know it is basically I'm sure they got exactly what they wanted but like the first two acts are this cute sort of uh ET-esque story of these kids trying to you know figure out this mystery and then the third act is just them in like this funhouse alien ship uh mm-hmm. with the weird sets and the and the dry ice and everything and then the last 10 minutes is just like a stand-up routine <laughs> with old jokes from a guy in a rubber costume and it's like it's just a lot of um, it's a lot of whiplash kind of near the end. That's what I was wondering, I, and I don't know if I was just like maybe I had a question because I felt like maybe I was projecting this, but like by the end, like you said, the movie was cynical, but by the end, like, do you think it was like a little satirical? Maybe, like, maybe I'm just thinking about you know Gremlins two, or like yeah. uh, he he even did Looney Tunes back in action. <laughs> Which was that's yeah yeah he did. constantly it was the it was like Gremlins too so I was wondering if there's a little bit of that here like especially with what I was saying about they get up there and it's like the whole movie this kid he's inspired by all this pop culture essentially that he's uh, consumed and and like that's that's like what kind of what it feels like the message is is how inspiring that can be and. You know, Dick Miller's character, he kind of forgot that, but then he's he sees this image of the ship floating off into space, and it's, like, inspiring. But then they get up there, and it's like, no, we, these other aliens are just a bunch of kids, and they're also just regurgitating this nonsense back yeah. at you, and you're just some kid, you know? Yeah. I think that the movie, um, because of its kind of rewritten ending, has to quickly switch back to... No, it's very inspiring. It's, you know, we're receiving a new message. Maybe we can build something different and this will continue. But I think it's fine for Ethan Hawke. We need to see Ethan Hawke's um, kind of faith in this idea smashed. It just shouldn't come so late in the film. You know, if it came kind of at the midpoint of the film where his idealism uh, is, he finds out it's not Forbidden Planet. It's not like all this cool stuff that he read about. Um, And then you can kind of build it back up. But yeah, he gets up there and he's like, um, he's just singing Little Richard. Like, is the, this is it? Like, where, where are the where are the secrets of the universe? And then on top of that, we've got one more, you know, reveal when the alien's parent comes in and we realize, oh, that they're just kids. I, I, I don't think you should space that back too far into the film, but I think if it doesn't all come kind of at the end, it, it makes a little more sense. But I like the idea that they're a little disappointed. You know, the same thing happens. This is just a space-bound Stand By Me, really. Instead of seeing mm, the body, they're okay. seeing a spaceship. And the kids in Stand By Me, you know, they come back a little changed as well. And, and things that a dead body is not something cool. It's just a dead body. The guy's like rotting. He's dead. Uh, and they realize like that their dreams aren't exactly what they what they thought. But they build these you know relationships and connections with each other uh, and, and come out wiser. Yeah. So that, I think the bones of the movie are good. That I agree. And that had me feeling like because I had read like Joe Dante's quote about like, this isn't really the movie I wanted to make. 
Yeah. And yeah. I part of me wonders, like, again, I don't I don't want to just assume, but like maybe if that's more of what he was going for, like trying to get that to come across even more than it does. Yeah, I was thinking about his other films, and I don't know if any of his films have that me- melancholy of a message. Um, but Cause even, maybe small social small soldiers. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, because I even thought like even that ending they tacked on, it felt like to me that also comes off as a uh, like maybe the studio is like, well, we don't want the movie to end like yeah, super yeah. on a downer. Like the kids want to feel like they're going to space, so like. Let's just yeah. throw this on. Yeah, and like trying to shove the the, the girl in. It's just all the well, stuff with the with the girl. With the it's gr- just that like eighties weirdness. The kids peeping peeping toms. Well, and... that's what I kind of like though. In the deleted scenes, the kids are all oh. <laughs> they're all extremely weird. And yeah, like, the way the, I mean, they're acting very much how kids, certain kids that age, act about girls, but it. It would then it kind of fits in the message more too about like needing to like mature, you know, that's yeah, kind of, yeah. Of, of like coming back more mature is like before you were acting like a little shithead kid towards this girl. And, you know, in the end, you don't get with her. It's only yeah. in your like child, even with the kept ending, it's like only in his childlike fantasy <laughs> that he you yeah. know, gets her affection, I guess. Yeah. And it, that would even fit better if we saw him watching um either like romantic films or seeing like uh, romance in his sci-fi films. It reminds me of the scene in E.T. where E.T. gets drunk, you know, and Elliot is, um, it kisses the girl, you know, in his, um, in his classroom while like the wind machine blows. Um, But the, but the deleted scenes were not that like, that was just, I felt like that was so painful. The whole thing with them going to the party and, uh, and him, him trying to give her the ring or whatever. And like, you know, some things, some things are cut for good yeah. reasons. I don't know. There's something I liked about it. Cause it felt like, Oh, this is the part where he goes to the party and he like makes good with the girl, but he really doesn't, you know, like yeah. it ends and it's like, no, you're still weird. And then he never talks to her again for the rest of the movie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Until he's dreaming about her, you know, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, I, you know, I thought the music was great. Of course it's Jerry Goldsmith oh. who's doing the music in the film. That's what, um, like, even with the certain things is, like, where the pacing or whatever is all weird, like, just so, so visually and then, like, musically so often it's like, wow, this is just, like, a really great movie to look at and listen to, I guess. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Jerry Goldsmith score was awesome. Um, I was thinking about all the cool sci-fi movies that they show clips from. And, of course, some of the movies that we've watched uh, on the show here, uh, Forbidden Planet, um, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, I got to really dig in and we got to find a Trek episode that was inspired by This Island Earth. Because I'd love to watch This Island Earth for the show. That's a great movie. Mm, they they also reference in this, so they don't really show it, but War of the Worlds. And I was like, I wonder if there's yeah. a War of the Worlds Paramount. episode. That's a Paramount movie, yeah. Hmm. Boy, they would be really weird if there wasn't. Yeah, that's what I love. 75 episodes in, we are still we can still be surprised <laughs> by how it's... Trek has been influenced by oh, other yeah. media. Uh, any other thoughts about the film? It's, you know, all I can really say about it is, like, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's, it's not um, a fantastic film by any means. Um, it was rushed out by Paramount to combat a little movie called Back to the Future. We all know how that turned out. (laughs) So it was kind of ill-fated from the start. But I think there are some really fun ideas. And I think that um, the, of course, watching the sort of young actors who would turn into um, better older actors um, have a lot of charm. Um, I just wish that they'd uh, expanded the Dick Miller thing a little bit. Like, did he want to be an astronaut when he was a kid or something like that? You know, like, what's his connection? But I do like the fact that he is like, yeah, go get him. Go get him, kid. I did like him. Yeah, there's like for me, there's enough hits enough of the quadrants of like what I need out of a movie that it's highly recommendable. Um, yeah. Like I said, it like visually, it's also pretty cool looking like there's, you know, the cool sets. Um, the I thought the rubber alien outfit was insane. Like, yeah, I thought yeah, it was really yeah. cool. And then, yeah, with the music overall and the, and the acting is good. All the all the actors and the kids are good. So, yeah, it's just like, to me, it's a very solid movie. I would highly recommend it. If they hadn't rushed this out, I wonder if it would have been different or completely shelved. Because, of course, 
1986, in January, uh, the Challenger exploded. And so oh, geez. Uh, having these kids wanting to be astronauts, putting a little space shuttle, possibly a model of the Challenger on the ship. I wonder if all that would have been different. Yeah, because there's even like when he's like and the kid at space camp gets to go. Yep. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, space camp came out 86, I think, as well. The movie Space Camp. I can't really remember. Oh, I don't. Uh, I'm not even aware of this movie. Oh, you haven't seen Space Camp? No. It's I, it's. I can't remember who directed it. It's produced by Spielberg, I believe, because his wife Kate Capshaw is in it, and jo- Joaquin Phoenix. Speaking of phoenixes, Whoa. a bunch of kids go to space camp, but there's a an error on the launch pad because they're in the shuttle for some reason, and it goes into space, and they all have to like find a way home. Whoa. I'm oh, looking at this. I've no- Your 80s movie education is not complete. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got to get... Oh, there's Joaquin. We got to get Space Camp in here. What about your 90s education? You ever see Gattaca? That's another movie where Ethan Hawke wants to be yeah, an astronaut. Yes, I've seen Gattaca. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He's got, a, he's got a, a role that he likes. So many connections. Yeah. I think we have uh, done our due diligence for Explorers. Let's take a break for a word from our sponsors. We'll be back with more backtracking. Mikan Hana. And I'm Caliban. And we're the hosts of the Sailor Noob Podcast. I'm the expert. And I'm the noob. You're talking into the wrong end of the microphone. Aye, aye. Okay. Every week we watch a new episode of Sailor Moon and learn about monsters, fashion, food, culture, and of course, the Sailor Warrior of Love and Justice, Sailor Moon. All right. Now, what is her rank? Is she an admiral or a rear admiral? Okay, shh, shh. The ad's almost over. We're a couple of magical people, and every week we moon prison power make up a new episode. Better than it ships. Study as she goes. Please stop that. Sailor Noob is available every Friday on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Shiver me timbers. Okay, we're back. It's time to talk about the Trek side of this equation. The original series of Star Trek is a strange beast in that it's based on the rigid tradition of the British Navy. It was written and produced by members of the greatest generation, and it espouses and defends the ideals of 60s counterculture. Sometimes these influences lead to mixed thematic messaging, but one fact is clear. James Kirk does not put up with bullies. Though Kirk himself was too cool to have kids, he projected the air of the cool dad of the contemporary TV era, one who would let you learn the hard lessons yourself, but also one who wouldn't fail to intervene when the game was unfair. Kirk would do anything for his crew, and he'll have to when the Enterprise meets one of their first godlike aliens in the Squire of Gothos. Captain's Log, Stardate 2126.1. We are weaponless and powerless unwilling guests of the creature who calls himself Trelane. I must say, they make a perfectly exquisite display pair. I object to you. I object to intellect without discipline. Mr. Spock, you do have one saving grace after all. You're ill-mannered. until you are dead. I want you to leave my crewmen alone, and I want you to leave my crew women alone, too. Are you ready? As the one challenged, I claim the first shot. Uh, this is a big one. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like this is one that uh, people people think about when they think about the original series. I always, yeah, I always heard about it um, back when I first started watching because I got into Next Gen first, and people would be like, "Oh, this is like he's like Q, kind of." He's like uh, the Trelane is, and and Q are related somehow. Yeah, so that that was back when I first watched it. That was like how I felt going into it, and it still it still has that. I still think about that every time, but I yeah. you know I do appreciate more of it every time i watch it's um it's funny because even at this point like this is the 17th or 18th episode of the first season they're still kind of working things out this is something we've run into when we've watched um, early tos episodes before but i don't think they know what year it is because uh they talk about how the space desert you know this void that they're in with no planets is 900 light years away from 
Earth, and that's a lot farther, I think, than uh, it's normally agreed on that the Enterprise would have uh, explored. Right. I mean, they are a deep space ship. Also, that means that like it took 900 years for the light and the TV signals and all the things that um, that Trelane has uh, been looking at to reach him, and so. Uh, yeah, it, the, the math doesn't work out at all. It, it might work out with the colonial era and with Napoleon, but as soon as he sort of sig heils Mr. Jaeger, like it just blows the whole thing out of the water. Unless unless tra- a TOS takes place in the in the 30th century, there's no way that that part right, works. Right, so. yeah. Yeah, those sort of things are easy to like not think about when watching Yeah. these as opposed to like I don't know. You start to when Star Trek starts to have more of a continuity is like when you start to like notice those things when they start to stick out. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is the old wild days when you know you could just say kind of whatever, but and that's fine. I mean, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt the show at all. But it's the kind of thing that Star Trek fans will complain about. It is fun. It's fun. I think uh, William Campbell uh, is a you know he was definitely a, a TV guy. Uh, he had done some movies and he had been around, but he was uh, I think. Uh, the perfect choice for this role, and the the costume the costumer for the show definitely agreed because I think uh, Gene Kuhn or whoever the producer was had to kind of push to get this guy to read because they originally wanted Roddy McDowell, who to be fair, Roddy McDowell would have been great too, but mm. it was kind of written for Roddy McDowell this part, and like the first they brought William Campbell in, and like the first paragraph or first couple lines he got out, the costumer's like. Well, I'm going to go start making his costume. <laughs> You're going to cast this guy. Like, he's oh, perfect really? for this role. That's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, he would uh, continue. He would come back uh, as uh, a Klingon in uh, the, the Trebles Tribbles. And of course, he would come back in DS9 as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Koloth. Yes. When he both, in both parts, he's kind of a, he's kind of a little troublemaker. He has kind yeah. of that, like, I'm a little stinker uh, yeah. vibe in both. <laughs> and then I love, you know, I loved when they brought him back in Deep Space Nine, they give all these guys one last go. Yeah. That's, that's so great. He deserved it. Yeah, he's he's awesome. Yeah, talk about your long-running canon and sort of like reaching back into previous series uh, to do something. That was, a, that was a really neat thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I just liked him a lot in this episode. It's cool. Like, some of the, that's like one of the best types of Star Trek episodes is like they just meet like a really weird guy and that's like the guy is mm-hmm. the whole episode you know i think yeah. back to when we we just did the one for uh with the clown you know that was that kind of thing where it's just like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. him being wacky for an episode like that's yeah that's awesome and, yeah and things kind of have changed since the 60s because in the 60s you would kind of do that like you write to guest stars right like who's the guest star this week um we need a big part for somebody to come on but like in 90s and modern trek you could ju- you're going to have you know characters that kind of come in and out, but you could just do an episode where Janeway and the crew are just dealing with an anomaly or something, and there is no guest star. And from what I remember about the thaw, they weren't really like writing that for Michael McKeon, right? Like they just were sort of they just sort of wrote a part and didn't even think, oh, let's get mm, right. comedy legend <laughs> and Spinal Tap uh, David St. Hubbins, uh, Michael McKean in here. And he just took the role as like, a, well, I just, you know, my agent said, hey, they're doing a Star Trek. And so I just <laughs> took it. So it's a lot different than like this being like a big deal for William Campbell, him being great in the role and them having now a guy in their sort of quiver to use for other projects. Oh, yeah. So there's like more, even more stakes to it here. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple different uh, guest stars in this episode, and one of them, uh, squint your eyes, and he kind of looks like John Hamm. Uh, it's Mr. DeSalle. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can see that. Doesn't he kind of look like John Hamm? Or at least he's got that, like, he's got 60s face. Six, that's right. That's He's, like, just st- forever stuck with that look. Yeah, I can just, see it. Uh, just, a, yeah, just a black Irish guy. Uh, <laughs> he's going to be drinking some whiskey and doing his thing. Uh, he would come back a couple times. Uh, he was in Cat's Paw, uh, and he was in This Side of Paradise as well. So uh, another guy that they said, yeah, bring that guy back. Yeah, for sure. He's good. I, I liked him in here. I they, they treated him like, you know, he was a reoccurring character. Like he was just as part yeah. of the crew as like uh, Bones or something. Yeah, TOS is kind of weird about that because they have people like... 
uh, Eddie Paskey or, or John Sheridan, like guys who are just always kind of there. But it's it's anybody's guess as to whether they will get a line this week, you know, or whether they'll um, be important to it. Sometimes they'll kill those people off and then they just <laughs> they'll just come back anyway because, uh, you know, <laughs> we didn't want to get rid of the actor. Like yeah. The guy's going to still be around. Yeah, it's like, um, I don't know, maybe it's just like different because it, it's like when I think of like, you know, all the random reoccurring side characters on like TNG or Deep Space Nine, it feels like you watch that and you understand more like, oh, this is a side character. They're not going to be part of the crew like for all the time. Yeah. I guess they, Whereas... they even they had their own, like I think of like, uh, who's the girl who spilled the like coffee on Picard? Sonia Gomez. Sonia yeah. Gomez. I thought, oh, she's for sure coming back. Right. And, then... and that was the second season, right? And that was the the, the old guard still, you know, like um, Maury Hurley, who I think was producing TV in the 60s or at least writing it. And um, I, I think Fontana and Gerald and all the, the really old guard were gone at that point, but they were still trying to do TV the old way. Thinking mm. like, hey, let's introduce a wacky character. But then cooler heads prevailed and they're like, wait, why are we doing this? We're not going to bring this person back ever. That yeah. was dumb. I, I love that. I think that adds a lot to it. That it's like, you just never know who's going to show up. Are they going to come back? Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> now with the internet uh, and, and the way fandom is, like every side character, people are mad that... Uh, that uh, Bryce doesn't have enough to do on Discovery. Like every single person you see is like, bring so-and-so back. And I'm sure the production is like, they're just there so somebody can hold a tray or something. But okay. <laughs> yeah, that's like, I don't know. I guess because we've seen it happen with so many other characters, you know, like yeah. eventually get that spotlight, you know, that it's like you see someone and you just kind of like them and you just, you want that to happen for their character too. Yeah. There, speaking of discovery, there is, of course, a line in this uh, episode where Captain Kirk says that they should notify the discovery about this planet that they have found. Uh huh. And that some people, you know, when discovery was announced, uh, kind of went back through old Trek and they're like, oh my God, the discovery, it, it existed back then. And uh, obviously, no, it didn't. They've killed that because the discovery went to the future and nobody can talk about it. But I think maybe Shatner maybe just flubbed his line, notify the Federation of the Discovery or, or something like that. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Or maybe they're like, maybe they just commissioned another Discovery after they disappeared. I suppose, but wouldn't that make people ask where the other other Discovery is? <laughs> maybe they tried to convince everybody this was the Discovery all along. Maybe, because you said they're like 900 light years away. Maybe they're like... It seems- they're actually so oh, maybe far away. they don't. Oh, <laughs> they yeah. found out yet. <laughs> they forgot. Yeah. <laughs> no, that just makes That's... sense. <laughs> uh, I, godlike characters, uh, godlike aliens are a big part of Star Trek. This has to be, you know, one of the first. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, who might have been before this, but certainly the most memorable. And when a guy like Q shows up, people go, oh, he's like Trelane. Like, he definitely left an impression on people. And I like the idea that he is, um, it's maybe not media necessarily, unless he can only get the History Channel. But he is, you know, absorbing Earth culture. And when when, uh, Kirk and, and his crew show up, he's trying to show us what he thinks that we'd like. You know, he has watched the tumultuous history of um, Europe at war, you know, in the 17th and 18th century or 19th century. And so he's like, oh, this is what you like. And yes, you kill and you take what you need. And I understand these emotions. And I like that idea that he um, is just doing at first what he thinks that we want. Later on, we find out that part of the problem is much like a child, he doesn't have context for these um, these things that he sees, and it is further complicated by the fact that as an energy being or whatever, he doesn't. He also doesn't feel things. He doesn't feel pain. He doesn't feel hunger. He doesn't understand need or want. Much like a child doesn't understand that you have to work, you know, sixty hours a week to to keep a roof over everybody's head and that sort of thing. He doesn't know, um, you know, the responsibilities of adults, and he doesn't understand the consequences of of the war and the and the the, the oh, killings yeah. that he sees. That is, that is, I never thought about that sort of twist on it. I just immediately thought about how it's similar 
you know, to like Q does the same thing in his first episode. Kind of shows us like things from our past that mm-hmm. you know maybe we shouldn't feel great about or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's present here. I think that that's you know, there's a reason that that Trelane only talks about you know he's a general retired, uh, but he talks about. Napoleon and he talks about Nazis and he's only focusing on that. Now, you know, little boys like to play war and they like to play um, cowboys and Indians and that sort of thing as well. But I think that that is a subtle anti-war commentary uh, in the vein of what Star Trek would often do. Yeah. Yeah. And you can look at this child that he's so excited about all these dumb uniforms and and guns and things like that. Yeah. And like, like a kid, uh, like the kids, I guess. And, uh, in explorers they he doesn't know how to like talk to women in you know in way they <laughs> like want to be talked to you know so yeah yeah that like was very fitting i thought too yeah thank god uh ethan hawk hawk's character didn't get any powers to do anything with uh, women no, that'd be like um who's it? like charlie x doesn't that happen to him yeah it does what if a little are you, kid? Are you proposing a Charlie X and Zapped crossover? <laughs> uh, sure. I've never seen Zapped, so with Scott Bayo, wow. we can talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's. Yeah. Let's make it happen. <laughs> there, there's one other thing with the with the twist in this that I thought of. I had, maybe it's obvious, but they did the sort of a parody of this on Futurama. Oh, okay. All right. And that one. Have you seen that episode? No, I, I'm woefully uh, unfamiliar with Futurama. Uh, well, you but would, I know there's a lot of Star Trek uh, references. You would love this. Thematically, it connects well. They they reference a lot of episodes, but the premise is this energy being who is a fan of Star Trek. Uh, basically, like he abducts all of the former cast and gives them their bodies back because they're not, you know, their heads in jars, and he sure. basically uh, makes them do a Star Trek convention for him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. And then, like, the twist at the end is his his energy beam parents come up and they're like, "We told you to clean your room," and you realize he's just kind of like a pathetic little fanboy, you know? Well, he is the whole episode. He's making them do their his fan scripts and stuff like that, uh, and he's just like, you know, a bully and petulant, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a perfect like parody of this episode while like kind of updating it to it kind of mixes in i think the cultural metaphor of explorers and you know is it's more of a commentary on like fanboyism i guess or something yeah well that's kind of what we almost got with uh ds9 when they wanted to do instead of uh, trials and tribulations for the 25th anniversary they wanted to do um, a return to uh, Iota Sigma or whatever the planet is from a piece of the action. And they find out that after Kirk and company like, you know, went to their planet, they became influenced by that visit. And so they go back and the whole the whole planet is one big Star Trek convention, basically. A bunch of people dressed up like Star Trek. That's amazing. That's yeah. a great so you, idea. You came up with that completely independently <laughs> on your own, even though they've already, already had that idea. That but. seems like a lower decks thing. It do. really does, doesn't it? Maybe that like the is whole just series the of lower decks. lower decks. Yeah, that's but... just lower decks. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh, would they have the bravery to do something like that? They should. That would be awesome. I think lower decks. One of its pro- many problems, uh, according to me, is I think it needs to be more critical. Self-con- Not critical, but like it needs to. La- it's supposed to be laughing at Star Trek, but having like a Mogato jerking off. Like I don't really see how that's laughing at Star Trek. Like I think it needs to like you know, make fun of Star Trek a little more. It has references, but the references are never like, this is kind of like dumb. Like it's not trying to poke holes in the, in the balloon. It's just sort of like, this is a great balloon. Like, yeah, I, I agree. It's a good balloon. But <laughs> yeah, Futurama, yeah. Futurama's funny because it makes fun of like the, the kind of stupidity of some of these Star Trek make, premises. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I 100%. I like that one of the ways that they um, solve this issue is that uh, <laughs> they get to, Trelane sets a table for them and uh, Bones is like, oh, someone say booze? <laughs> and apparently <laughs> starts drinking the wine. And then later on, he comes up and he's like, this guy's full of shit. This booze, this booze tastes, like, <laughs> tastes like shit. So like, I, tr- I trust uh, Bones when it comes to booze. Something's wrong here. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's so good. Yeah, I love the, like, he doesn't, he doesn't have any of the substance. That's what's great. That's like the yeah, context you yeah. discussed. 
Yeah, he's seen a picture of a of a delicious dinner, but he doesn't know like what it tastes like. Yes, fire fire without heat. Right. Yeah. That's and it's like yeah. That's. I mean, we can only we can only really reflect our experience, but you know, you gotta you gotta actually be there. I like that. Yeah. That's why it's like a, a giant mirror is on the wall. It's like a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we get a classic episode or uh, instance of, of Kirk uh, acting up, you know, and like, all right, I've got a plan and I'm going to act like an asshole or, uh, you know, act <laughs> in a way that uh, to, to fool somebody into something. And so he sort of goads him into this uh, Hamilton-esque duel. Yes. And he's like, wow, one of your many Earth heroes, Alexander Hamilton. And I was sort of thinking, like, do you think by this time people would be like, Man, you know who's cool? Alexander Hamilton. I just don't <laughs> see it. I don't think people in like however hundred years will like really care about him at all. Well, they could have cut to our modern crew like rolling their eyes. Uh, but this does come. <laughs> this does come from a guy who uh, just a few minutes before called Uhura a Nubian prize. So clearly his yeah. his information is out of date. <laughs> You know, it's cool. Federalism. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe not so much. But then again, they are a federation. So who, who can yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, that's true. They probably do like that stuff. It's a great bit where uh, they have the duel and Trelane, you know, toying with them, you know, just shoots his gun into the air. And then you have the thing where Kirk is going to aim at him and then he takes aim and fires at the mirror, which when it breaks, like we get that something's gone wrong, but there's like a series of like comical. There's like, boing, boing. boings and sproings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I loved it. I couldn't believe that you that was You broke his goofy comedy computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <now. laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I also like, yeah, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang just took one. Uh, but I like the fact that it, that doesn't solve everything. Um, you know, we were talked about how, or at least how I think that uh, Explorers really goes off the rails near the end. This episode kind of goes off the rails near the end because they kind of resolve it in the way that you think that you would in a Star Trek episode or a sci-fi short story. But there's like, you know, 10 minutes left. And so he gets sucked back to the planet. Well, first of all, the planet chase Is that planet following us? <laughs> the planet like starts chasing them. That was cool. And he gets sucked back there. Then he's put on trial. Then we're going to do a most dangerous game. Uh, then he's a kid and his parents are energy beings. And it's like hats on wigs on hats. You know, when you put it that way, you're so right. Because I had, I had honestly forgot about the trial, but now I I remember that. <laughs> I just remember it as like he shoots the mirror, and then like his parents show up. But yeah, there is like two other things that happen in the middle. Yeah, there's a whole action scene. Yeah, in the middle. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, it's like he's like Q. He's but this time he's just putting him on trial. Yeah, that didn't need to be there at all, actually. I think it works okay. I like the fact that it's really, I think, for Kirk um, and for, without them knowing it, uh, for Q, uh, 20 years in the future. But it's really for Kirk to just show, you know, still early in the show, that he's going to, A, he's going to do absolutely anything for his crew. And so he says, look, I'll let you hunt me, you know, like a dog to the death, but you got to let my ship go. And B... I'm not going to put up with this shit. You know, you, I don't re recognize your authority. This is a kangaroo court and I'm just going to yell and scream at you, uh, uh, you know, about the fact that I am my own man until you, you know, just do something. He basically just, basically just uh, dares <laughs> trying to kill him at that point. He's like, yeah, let's just do it. Come on, motherfucker. Let's, let's get it on. That's true. It is cool. It is cool. And I like when Kirk, is, like, this is more during the, the party, but I like, I do like what you said about Kirk's plan. He does this a lot where he's like, I'm just going to become a raging asshole. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> like, that's my <laughs> activate. Yeah. Uh, protocol asshole. Yeah. That's another thing where I think people think like, because of stuff like that, where people think like, that's kind of an element of the Kirk character is that he's like an ass when he's not, you know? Yeah. Um, similar to what you're saying about like how it's like he's always seducing women and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's like a thing that he's done and they present it as like he's deceiving someone. And now that becomes part of his modern character. And that's that's kind of what I felt like. Like Kirk is like a pretty nice guy. And then I love these scenes where he's like, I'm just going to go 
completely off the handle and and like be a menace to this guy. That's like yeah. one of his best <laughs> modes. I'm going to push this guy into into taking the next step, you know, trying to kill us or, or freaking out or whatever. He doesn't know, I don't think at this point, although I think Kirk has kind of an inkling that he, because he says um, that Trillane is acting, you know, like a child. And I don't think he knows fully, but he does push him in this direction to the point where Trillane is like, ooh, well, I felt something there. You know, I got angry. You know, this is this is uh, the passion that you're talking about. This is what a humans feel. Let's let's do some more of it. And of course, it ends up with Kirk getting hunted in a forest. I'm not sure that that's what he had planned, but uh, it does eventually push him uh, to. He's trying to push him to make a mistake, you know, or to um, to lose control of the game. There's a you know a lot of the effects on early Star Trek aren't that great, and of course now they've been updated for for Netflix, but. Um, I really like the uh, very simple camera trick where Kirk is uh, on the front steps of the of the palace and he moves left and he moves right and the uh, the the bars appear on either side. Like it's just it's really well done. It's an easy effect, but it it really like, oh, yeah. emphasizes that like yeah, Trillian is done playing with you. He's going to put you in the corner now. That, that's like the most classic like film trick obviously is just making yeah, things just appear and cut. disappear yep. yeah. but uh i it always it always is cool when he does the same thing where he's like snapping stuff in and out of existence and yeah and yeah. it must be at that point that he really does start to understand because that's the point where he just slaps Trelane. he's like give me that shit <laughs> takes the sword and breaks the sword he's like you know well, i'm not doing this anymore he just breaks it that was so yeah. funny <laughs> yeah and then, uh, and then the the the, the parents show up. Uh, Bart Larue and uh, Barbara Babcock show up and uh, tell them it's time to go. And I think Campbell does a really good job of, uh, oh, you said I could. I never get to have any fun. Yeah, yeah. That's the best. That's I mean, such a memorable scene. That's why I think you've seen it replicated a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love I love that part. Just like he, he's like such a, a brat about it, you know. He's just uh, you, you wonder what who what he's done to other people, you know. The parents tell Kirk they're sorry they're, that his life path has been disturbed, and I kind of wonder like what other aliens' life paths may have ended uh, at this point uh, because they went out for a, a drink and, uh, and right. Trillane was uh, running the house. <laughs> they say it like. We'll make sure your life control works. To, like they, they just have like you know, the protocol in place. They just know, yeah. <laughs> know what to do exactly. The energy checkbook comes out. All right, how much do we owe you? Yeah. They yeah. didn't have to be like, how do these people like breathe? Oh, no, we figured that out, you know. <laughs> uh, we got to have the beedly boop boop uh, ending on an early Star Trek episode. And so Spock wants to know how to put it into the log. And Kirk says, a god of war. I was like, what? God of war? But uh, no, put down, he was a, a small, naughty boy. And of course, <laughs> Spock does not understand what he's talking about. They don't have Tom Sawyer on Vulcan. So he's like, pigtails and inkwells, what the hell? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was thinking, though, like, he, he, no one's going to actually make that reference <laughs> in that part of the future. <laughs> I guess, I you know... Star Trek uh, future humans love their uh, 19th century literature. And so uh, I have to believe that Mark Twain has existed simply because Picard knows who he is when they run into him in, in San Francisco. Um, so, yeah, maybe the idea That's of true. Uh, naughty boys like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn uh, would be remembered. They, yeah, because if they like, they're like jazz and classical yeah, they certainly do. I've been tracking now because I'm watching in order. I've been tracking when the references come in because, like, yeah. I'm watching Voyager now, and they're like, "Okay, rock and roll." We can mention rock and roll, and I was like, "You guys should be talking about Nirvana," but instead they're talking about like you know rock and roll. Yeah, Bill Haley or yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. wait till they find out about hip hop or whatever. You know, they're gonna yeah. go nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a, a trap artist from the uh, 21st century. <laughs> that's a SoundCloud rapper. Yeah. <laughs> to explain SoundCloud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's, you know, we complain about that, but you, you don't really want Trek to, you know, try to get uh, the, the Megan the Stallion on as a guest star or something like that, as Megan the Stallion. Totally bring her in as a, as a future alien character, but you don't want to have it be too pandery. Uh, and so if you they meet somebody, it's Amelia Earhart, you know, or, or something like that, something safe 
uh, safely in the past. So also something public domain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> like you can have Tom Morello on as an officer, but you can't play Rage Against the Machine. That's not going to work. That that would be a good fit. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that we have uh, not only talked uh, to completion about the Squire of Gothos, but I think that we have totally proved that uh, these episodes, uh, if not directly connected, are certainly um, digging in the same holes thematically. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're, it's like, like I said, when you start it, you don't see it. But then by the end, you're like, yeah, these are the same type of story here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder... I wonder what it's going to take for, you know, you read like, um, I read like this quotation the other day and it was like, um, the children these days, you know, they, they're rude, you know, they, they read, um, bad books. Uh, they put their feet on the table and you're like, all right, who is this? It was Socrates in like the year, you know, 300 BC or something like that. And so I'm not sure that humanity will ever totally change, but I wonder when we'll stop so quickly and directly scapegoating media for the horrible things that happen, the horrible things that people perpetrate in this world. I can't believe that in the the wake of the recent mass shootings, like immediately the uh, conservatives go back to the old playbook of blaming video games, you know, and movies. Right. Yeah. And I feel like it's become just more, even more prominent now too. Like, yeah. Like, I guess, well, I don't know. Cause there's not like, I'm sure there are, like, political hearings on this, but I guess there's nothing like, you know, nothing as much of a media event as the 90s or whatever. But it it does, I just feel like I see people complaining about that type of stuff all the time, you know, of like violence and stuff like that. And I was like, we decided, like, 30 years ago that that was, like, a silly thing to laugh at that notion, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but but did we? I don't know if we keep deciding and then we keep having it come back because it was... You know, it was hot coffee and and doom and violent video games. And then before that, it was gangster rap. And before that, it was Judas Priest. And I'm sure before that, it was Zeppelin or something like that. Um, Of course, uh, parents hated rock and roll. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the reasons I think that Little Richard wrote and sang that song uh, all around the world that we hear in The Explorers about uh, the rock and roll uh, queens and and their cats. And they just want to just want to dance. And so, like, it's always going to be. It's always going to be something that the older generation does, which is look down on and criticize the younger generation. But like, I just don't know why we're so smart. You can't forget that 30 years ago, somebody said it was music's fault or video games fault. Like everything is recorded now. All these tweets are still around. Everything is still around. So you think they'd have to get some new, uh, new line other than just, oh, it was uh, Fortnite. No, I, I just think people believe that, I guess. I don't know. When people start doing the floss dance uh, in, in, in a crowded grocery store, then you know uh, it's Fortnite's fault. Yeah, I think it's it's probably just because the like culture is like the number one thing everyone argues about. So you, <laughs> you just got to argues about. <laughs> you know, like it's not a, it. It just can't be enough that you don't want to see Joker. You have to actually believe if someone sees it, they're going to kill they're you. Do some yeah yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I just think, yeah, so every, it's like, we just got to argue about, it's like, that's why I feel like it's intensified, but yeah. maybe that's just, that could be, be just me being like similar of like, oh, kids nowadays, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea what kids nowadays are even into anymore. So I, I, I couldn't criticize it or scapegoat it if I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, at, we're are we out of touch? Maybe. <laughs> I think uh, you, you, we're kind of like Ethan Hawke and River Phoenix, aren't we? We came back from that great, <laughs> that great meeting in the sky, a little disillusioned, but perhaps a little wiser. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know that kids like technology, and something that makes Trek Trek is the technology of the future. It sometimes facilitates what the characters are doing, but just as often, it's the actual complication that they are dealing with in the episode. So on every show, we randomly pick from a list of Star Trek technologies. We add what we get to the non-Trek media, and we subtract it from the Trek episode to see how each would be different. We call this our technological exchange, 
And both our episode and the movie that we saw uh, specifically deal with technology here. So we'll see uh, how this pans out. Our list of technologies are phasers, holodecks, tricorders, transporters, warp drives, replicators, communicators, shields, advanced medical technology, and androids. And if I roll on my random number selecting technology, I get number five, warp drive. Uh, If warp drive existed in the world of explorers uh, before the movie starts, how would explorers be different? Wouldn't be that exciting (laughs) about them finding this thing. Yeah. Um, They'd already be in space and met the weird aliens. (laughs) I wonder if the it, well, you'd have a totally yeah, because the, the, the traveling to space is the entire thing. God damn it! <laughs> Just destroyed another <laughs> another movie. But all right, think about it this way: it's not the so, same movie, though. No, it's a totally different movie. <laughs> uh, because the second that so it, it, here's something else that I think is interesting that we didn't mention about explorers: the dad alien doesn't care at all. Like he doesn't. Uh, it seems like he does make a bang zoom to the moon thing. And I'm not sure if that is just a comedy ad lib or maybe when he was younger, he cared about the weird transmissions. Do you, you know what I mean? Oh, but okay, like, yeah. but mostly he is not rock. Like old <laughs> cat skills, comedians and 50 size five movies are rock and roll for these aliens. It's what the kids are into. And so maybe like these signals get out there. The second they get out there, whatever generation of kids, uh, alien kids are out there. They get in their cars and they, you know, uh, come to Earth. Or, or the second that, hmm, no, well, would would humanity already be among the stars? We would already have met the aliens. This whole thing has fallen apart. Oh, around me. wait. So are you saying like, does the dad alien he likes like old timey music from Earth though? Yeah, well, as long as because it's it, it, there's there, there would only be a couple generations, right? Because it's just how, like how far radio signals have gone. So uh, it seems like whack and neek, like fifties movies. They're into uh, the day the earth stood still, and they're into like Henny Youngman uh, jokes. And so maybe, but that's when the Honeymooners was on TV, though in the fifties. I don't know. I'm with you. I'm with your theory that uh, he, the dad, likes the speeches of Hitler or, or whatever the first radio transmissions were. Uh, we got to get this, this back got on track. A good point. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, his little arm, the head arm, is sick heiling. Um, all right. We got to get this back on track. So, like, humanity is already amongst the cosmos. Mm. So maybe the how do we preserve the the premise of the film. I, I know how. Okay. You know how, like, they've done it a few times in Star Trek where it's like, what if we're the alien invaders? You know? So what if what if it's just a reverse Explorers where we're... Uh-huh. we're uh, that That's actually a good uh, Star Trek episode idea. Maybe they've done it where they're trying to figure out, like, how can we make first contact with these people? How can we understand them? But all the transmissions are like, it's kind of like a Tinker Taylor doctor or whatever, where like, it's not the real version of them, you know? So they, they totally judge a culture based on its uh, pop culture. And it isn't really like it's not, it actually goes against them and trying to make first contact or something. Yeah. Or the most recent, or the, one of the, the first episode of um, strange new worlds where um, Una uh, and her team have gone to this planet preparing for first contact and they've collected this information. So later on, Uhura is able to like look through the, the presses of, you know, this planet and can talk to the guy about Blitzball or whatever their, their sport is. Um, But if it was a reverse explorers, then my question is Neek and Wack like earth culture, but are they, do they have a teen culture of their own or are they just like, the Iotians in piece of the action where they're just really impressionable, you know, like let's say that humans did get there first and we're watching the Wackians, we'll call them for a uh, a lack of a better term. Like, do they have their own culture or are they like an empty slate, like waiting to be impressed upon? That's a good question. Cause yeah, we like literally only 
reflects back. Like, isn't the idea he's like kind of only reflecting back our culture? Yeah. I think it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible. <laughs> we get this a lot, but like maybe they would just flip <laughs> because, of course, we have to talk about how there's no warp drive in Star Trek. Good luck with that. Um, but like maybe we, you know, are, you know, we have to be careful not to become the Trelanes, you know, using our amazing technology to confound these aliens who are just trying to sort of live, you know, go through their life paths, if you will. Oh, yeah, yeah. It could be like, um, it could be like a thing where like, it could be a cross-cultural thing. Like when, when one culture like randomly gets like, <laughs> you could do a metaphor for like, uh, like people who are like way into Doctor Who or something. Like <laughs> Anglophiles. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or like, oh, there you go. <laughs> or like, you know, uh, uh, weebs or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there you go. If you do a reverse explorers, it would be us. We would beam our pop culture into the heads of these aliens, right? So instead of them sending us warp drive schematics, we find a way to send I Love Lucy like right into their brains when they sleep. And oh, it's in yeah. preparation of us assimilating and taking over their world. First, we familiarize them with our culture, and then we paint ourselves black and white and come down with a bunch of chocolates in our in our mouths, and they're ours. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Let's, this sounds more like you've got a plan. <laughs> let's uh, let's switch to Star Trek. Uh, if we eliminate warp drive from the Star Trek universe, how does the Squire of Gothos play out? Um, I think it's you recast it on Earth. So it is very similar. You just have you know, ostensibly a uh, advanced civilization, you know, on Earth in the 23rd century, not a galaxy spanning one. And uh, he's he's come to check up on us like he you know, we stopped killing each other. And now he comes in to, to find out why. So he shows up on Earth in uh, Napoleon era costume. And he's like, boy, you guys started, you know, there was a bunch of bombs and then you stopped killing each other. Like let's get, get, get back to it. Let's start killing each other again. I like that. I, the way I had started thinking it out did just end up making it explorer. So I, I think your answer is a lot better. <laughs> I was like, well, well <laughs> they would have to just send it to people on earth. Yeah. And then, okay, well, then how do we get up in space? Well, they'd have to give them a way to get up. And I'm like, oh, wait, that's just the movie. Yeah. Mine is kind of like uh, <laughs> everything. This is, I love the, the technological exchange because it just proves how everything is influenced by everything. Uh, that's the secret uh, origin yeah. of the technological exchange. But uh, but yeah, mine is just a, a Trelane-themed version of Star Trek IV <laughs> where Trelane is the probe that comes back and is like, I heard from the What's whales in a while. On? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to talk to some whales. I want to see some whales kill each other. That would be good. That would be like, um, no, that would just be like the movie Pixels. Oh, okay. It's like, what happened to Pac-Man? Right, yeah. <laughs> it's just like oh my God. all your old nostalgia coming back. Well, to ready to you. watch Star Trek IV? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You've been watching Pixels. That's that's poor. That's that's too bad for Star Trek Four. You know, um, I was thinking about the fact that if we extend this the whole way, which we're supposed to, and there is no uh, warp drive, that means that the Vulcans never arrive to uh, alter humanity's future and to provide them with um, what they need to recover from World War Three. So maybe Earth never becomes a paradise. Maybe it is. Uh, just continually warring, and it's like the best cable package ever for Trelane. Oh. Like for hundreds of years, he's just watching us kill each other in more advanced ways. It becomes Warhammer 40k, essentially. Oh yeah, just more more new wars for him. Yeah. Oh, that's like it would become like a uh, like when an action series or something goes on way too many sequels. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, oh, or <laughs> I've seen or maybe- this so many times. Yeah, they're doing they're doing this again, a uh, twenty four season nine. Um, yeah, but and then so maybe like eventually humanity does work it out, but then Trelane shows up because he's like, no, no, come on, you gotta gotta get back to fighting. You know, we have this whole thing going. We're, we've got the pay per view. We're ready to watch this next thing. 
Um, speaking about stealing things, uh, as we have been, this reminds me of the X-Men villain Mojo, who is... Mojo. He's from another universe, like another dimension. And in his dimension, uh, all economy and all culture is based on TV. And so he is essentially like the president and like network programmer of his dimension. And so he always kidnaps the X-Men and puts them in like arenas to fight and stuff like that because that's it's good ratings. You know, he's always trying to like his the oppressed uh, uh, immiserated citizens of his universe. Their only escape is television. Uh, good commentary. And so they but they love it when the X-Men come on because of these un- underdogs. So he's always trying to kidnap them and put them into new like scenarios. I think that's how we should do do society. Actually, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> that's a, the opiate of the masses. That's is good comment. Yeah. Well, we had we did have the game show president, as they like to say. Yeah. So I we need to get more game show hosts. Oh my god. And and uh, Mojo's a big fat ass. So yeah, with uh, <laughs> actually he's got big hands. I think instead of tiny hands. But yeah. I say we let Howie Mandel get a shot. <laughs> What's how we up to? <laughs> Him and VP. No, it would have to be switched. Steve Harvey would probably be good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, mission accomplished. <laughs> I dare go no further uh, down that road. Oh, yeah. But let's tell people what's coming up on the next episode of Backtracking. Yeah, our next one, it's the next one is a really big one, I think, too. We've had a lot of those this year, but we're going to be talking about Moby Dick. And it's referenced all over Star Trek, but we're specifically going to be talking about the movie First Contact, which, yeah. you know, they kind of draw a thematic line in that one. And it's going to be a great double feature because I, th- I think we were talking about watching the movie with uh, Patrick Stewart. Yeah, the, the TV miniseries. Yeah, with Patrick Stewart. Yeah. So, so I like when we get to do Patrick Stewart on Patrick Stewart. That's always pretty fun. Yeah. And we already talked about, which it came out actually around the time that uh, First Contact came out. So he was uh, working on wow. it at the same time. <laughs> um, you know, we already talked about Wrath of Khan, of course. And so that's kind of out. But I do think that it's a better fit for First Contact because instead of just having a character who, you know, overall, uh, his character arc kind of fits Ahab and he quotes the book sometime. And it is a, it's an exploration. Like Picard, of course, is well-versed. And so when he is confronted with the fact that he is acting in an Ahab way, he it has a lot more effect on him. And he himself goes into um, exposition about, you know, about the the circumstances of of Ahab's quest. And so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to talking about that and seeing uh, Patrick Stewart play this character. Yeah, that's cool. Like we did, you know, when we did um, Christmas Carol or whatever it's good to he like embodies kind of that classical aspect of star trek in a way he's like one of the most meta actors they've ever cast maybe the most yeah i don't think that there's no one could have taken his place um and i don't think they knew what they were getting you know i think they just thought oh he's got some gravitas but uh yeah it's uh, i mean i'm not i'm not schooling anybody here but yeah one of the best uh, actors who's ever been on, oh, yeah. on track well uh that's it for this week's backtracking and thanks for listening and if you like the show tell a friend you can follow us at, at @backtracking on twitter and tell us too what you think that we should look at in future episodes and gooey tell the people where they can find you online you can find me i'm on twitter at, at @gooeyfame and I'm at at K-A-1-I-B-A-N on Twitter, and you can find all of the shows on the Just Enough Trope Network on Twitter at at Just Enough Trope. And that is it for us this week. We'll see you soon. And until then, keep on trekking. Trekking.